Welcome to your next mission video podcast. I am fired up for this one. I always get motivated when I speak with soldiers. We have the command team of the 1st Armored Division of Fort Bliss, Texas, and we're going to talk about the history and, and how their nickname Old Ironside came about. They're also going to share their ideas about leadership, so hang on! We'll be right back. Welcome to Your Next Mission podcast with the 12th Sergeant Major of the Army and co-founder of the American Freedom Foundation, Jack L. Tilly. Hello out there, warriors, past and present, and your families, and thank you for your service to our great country. Now, before we get started, I personally want to thank our presenting sponsors, Calvary Agency, Navy Federal Credit Union, Purdue University Global, and Veterans United Home Loans for, for making Your Next Mission happen. They love our veterans. I'm going to say it every week. We love them too. <laughs> we, have a, we have an incredible show for you today. We're going to focus on the 1st Armored Division at Fort Bliss, Texas. And I'm so excited to introduce two crazy guys. No, two wonderful, two wonderful people. Major General James P. Eisenhower III, Commanding General, and Command Sergeant Major Michael C. Williams. Welcome to the show. Thanks, sir. Major, it's good to see you. Thanks for having us. Kind of, I kind of feel like the two old guys in Muppets. Standing <laughs> That's, right. Down. That's right. I look the same. Hey, hey before we get started, everybody, everybody really wants to hear a lot about what the division's doing. Yeah, I know you know I spent uh, about five and a half years in the division, and I love the 1st Armored Division. But before we do that, can each one of you, you know, tell the audience a little bit about yourself? And, sir, we'll start with you. Okay, Sergeant Major, thanks. Uh, my name's Jim Eisenhower. I, I tell people I've been in the Army 53 years. <laughs> I grew up in the Army. I was, uh, I was a kid in the Army moving all around. This move to Fort Bliss was my 28th. Uh, but uh, my dad was a career infantry officer and, and had a great time as a military kid uh, moving all around the world. I married my wife, Cheryl. She uh, grew up outside of Fort Campbell, Kentucky. We've been married for 27 years. We've got three boys. Uh, one's a consultant in New York City. The other's a young infantryman walking around the woods right now in Fort Benning, and the other is a, uh, a plebe at the Naval Academy. Oh, wow. Uh, and so we're really proud of, of all three of them and the work they're doing. And, and I've served in, I tell people I've served in I's and S's and A's. So I've been in an infantry brigade combat team, a striker brigade combat team, an armored brigade combat team. And thrilled to be here at Fort Bliss with the uh, First Armored Division of America's Tank Force. And sir, how, how long have you how, how long have you been the, the commander now at First Armored Division? I think we're working on about seven months. So I took command in July of last year. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, Major, go ahead. Oh, hey, good morning, Jack. Mike Williams, uh, been in the Army about 33 years, uh, so not quite as long as, as the boss here. He's got me by 20. Um, third generation Army. Uh, uncle was a tanker, and uh, grandfather was uh, field artillery, so I decided I'd go scout. Uh, served mostly at A's my entire career. Uh, I've gotten to serve about eight years in the 1st Armored Division, came here right out of the academy and been here almost ever since. Served at every level as a Sergeant Major within the division. Been in five brigades in this division. Uh, I think if I can get into the other two for at least 24 hours, I win a set of steak knives or something <laughs> if, uh, if, if, I can, if I can pull that off. Um, been, uh, I'm married to my, my beautiful wife, Charlotte. Got three awesome kids. Uh, that have joined me on this journey as we've uh, as we've, we've traveled around the world and and gone various places and done various things. But I got to tell you, this is uh, this is the culminating assignment for me. Just there's nothing better than being an iron soldier in the First Armored Division. Uh, we we say there's two kinds of soldiers. There's iron soldiers and those that wish they were. <laughs> you, you know, I can't believe I I believe everything you just said because, uh, like I said, I served a long time in the division. I think that was. Without a doubt, one of the best assignments I ever had. Of course, I was in Germany, but uh, I love the division. I, 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 in fact, I'll tell you the truth, I had uh, four division commanders. I really never wanted to leave, but unfortunately, I'd stayed so long, they, they probably wanted to kick me out anyway. So, hey, sir, I read in the, in the uh, First AD's website about Iron Six priorities. Can you tell the honest a little bit about what your priorities are? Sure. We've... Uh... You know, it, I'm the senior mission commander here at Fort Bliss, and one of the things people don't realize is how big Fort Bliss is. Uh, I think they confuse my rank as a senior mission commander and two-star division commander um, with the size of the installation. The reality is Fort Bliss on any given day has more soldiers than uh, every installation except for Fort Bragg. Uh, so we're larger than Fort Hood. We're larger than JBLM. Uh, and so that that gives us reason to kind of split our priorities. And so we've got 
three priorities for the division staff and the installation, because that's where the capacity exists to pursue these. Uh, and those won't be any surprise. It's, it's people, uh, readiness, and modernization. Uh, people first, uh, for logical reasons. You, you know, the Army is a, a people business, and leadership is a people business. And our most important weapon system is the soldier, uh, supported by their family and our DA civilians. Uh, the readiness is also pretty simple to explain, and that we have to be called when ready. And we'll talk a little bit more about what the division does, I'm sure, but um, we don't have the luxury of preparing. When the phone rings, we've got to be able to answer our constituents when the nation calls. And then modernization, as you know, Sergeant Major, we're, the whole Army is, is engaged in, in, in a significant modernization venture here. We usually see this about every 40 years. And, and what we're trying to do in the, uh, in the heavy force is uh, help lead the Army into an all-domain or multi-domain environment where we, uh, we, we try to present multiple dilemmas to an adversary so that we deny them the initiative and decision-making capacity. But at the brigade level and below, at the tactical level, we've intentionally issued priorities that are relatively simple, but you know they're, they're, the, the simplicity of the words belies their importance. Uh, and that's lead, maintain, and train. Uh, in those orders, or in that order. So very important for us to lead and set an example, solve soldier problems, invest in soldiers, keep the right ones in the Army, and inspire them to con uh, continued service. Maintain, you know, we're a platform-based heavy division. And so you know how complicated the M1 and the M2 and 3 and the H64 and UH60 can be, as well as the 109 Paladin. And so maintenance and the establishment and sustainment of those systems that allow us to employ those those complicated systems, but maintain their readiness is critical. And lastly, just training, uh, no surprise there, but the con consistent uh, maintenance of high readiness states is really contingent upon a, a unit training management system that allows us to provide predictability, but also sustain the highest levels of readiness we can throughout the year and not ebb and flow based off of the training cycle. Yeah. Hey, don't you, just to ask you a follow-on question, don't you do a lot with uh, modernization, new equipment and stuff comes down to the division? You test it uh, for the Army, too? You a lot of stuff. You want to say something about that, too? We do, sir, Major. Um, we have not fielded uh, the, the V3 yet for the for the Abrams, but uh, we're looking at fielding the IRCA, um, so long-range cannon. Uh, and we'll be the first division to field that. We're also looking at less than platform. You know, we typically associate modernization with specific platforms. One of the things our division staff is looking at in pursuit of the, one of the secretary's objectives, and that's um, gaining digital proficiency, uh, is, is our ability to bring in a data management platform that allows us to exercise mission command, uh, but also to conduct reconnaissance, to target effectively, uh, to do that and share common data rapidly so that we maintain the initiative and decision-making dominance uh, over an adversary. In a world where data is becoming ammunition, that's more important for headquarters and staffs at Echelon to be able to take in all the information that's available, cull through it quickly, and then use that to our advantage to make decisions faster. Yeah. For, for our listeners here today, a lot of people don't realize that the Army continues to transform and get new equipment, new technology. Uh, for the future, because that's a, that's an ongoing change all the way through. Hey, hey, Sergeant Major, uh, you know you got to have priorities for the non-commissioned officer corps to support the boss. There, what kind of priorities do you have for the non-commissioned officer corps within the division? Or what are that's your priorities? Question. I guess. So, well, so my priorities obviously are supporting the the, the CG's uh, priorities and the, and those of the division. And the way I kind of break that down for everybody. Um, is I focus on three lines of effort, generally speaking, and that's where my soldiers live, what they eat, where they work. And if we can get that right, then we're able to get after um, being fit, trained, and lethal because that's what we got to do in order to accomplish all the goals that the CG is getting after. So if my NCOs, top to bottom, from corporal to brigade command sergeant major, can get after those things, that'd be great. And we've done a lot of work on that. Um, where they live, you know, we've spent a lot of time and energy uh, making sure that our barracks are top rate and that they're well maintained and that leaders are present in those barracks and taking care of soldiers. Um, we've gone through and rewrote the entire barrack SOB. And in fact, uh, we've even gone so far as, um, you know, treating soldiers like adults because that's their homes. So we, we've rescinded the, uh, the policy on the installation that limits the amount of alcohol that soldiers can have in the barracks because uh, our soldiers are adults and we trust them and we treat them that way. And we've had no spike at all in, in incidents because of that. our soldiers are being responsible and do what iron soldiers should, uh, living a disciplined lifestyle. 
Um, and then where they eat, we've taken a lot of work to overhaul our dining facilities and the quality of the food there. And we've worked with the H2F partners to really renovate a lot of that. Uh, we've completely changed out the menus in those facilities as well to improve the quality of the, uh, the food our soldiers eat. And where they work is getting after, make sure they've got a quality workplace, that they are part of a cohesive team where they feel valued and where they trust their leadership and where they have an opportunity to do what it is that they signed up to do in the United States Army. Uh, and then once a week, I have an opportunity to speak at the newcomers uh, briefing to talk to all our new soldiers arriving to Fort Bliss and to the division. And one of the things I talk to them about, the main thing I talk to them about, in fact, is, you know, how do we translate people first in the first armor division? I tell them basically what it boils down to is making sure you come home vertically, not horizontally, when you're taken uh, into harm's way. And to do that, you got to be physically fit. You got to be trained in your in your skills. And you've got to maintain your equipment uh, because in the First Armor Division, we ride in the battle and then destroy our nation's adversaries and drive back for hot chow while other people are still walking. <laughs> um, so we got to make sure that that equipment works. And that kind of, you know, if I, I, I package it that way, Sergeant Major, so that NCOs can take that and translate it in because uh, General Eisenhower is great at putting it a lot more eloquently. Uh, but as you know, down on the motor pool line or out in the field, it doesn't always translate that way. Uh, to a young staff sergeant that I'm asking to get out there and train the soldiers hard and get them fit and ready. Uh, so I got to make sure that it translates to them. Uh, you, 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 you're you, motivating me so much. I'm sitting there listening to all the stuff that you're doing. I, I just love it. Hey, I, you know, I, I, when we first started talking here a few minutes ago, I could really see the, the connection uh, between you two. I mean, it's all about the team. It's all about the relationship. I, I wasn't going to ask you a question, but I want to ask you this question. What kind of relationship do you two have? Uh, serve, sorry, mate. Either one of you can start. Uh, <laughs> uh, That's very toxic. I can't stand it here. Okay. I, was, well, I knew you would say something like that. Like, okay. No, no, no. no sorry, Major, you know this. I mean, you, I'm sure you've seen it. You're a command sorry, Major so many times. But in my experience, it really relies on both leaders. Absolutely. When you can present a common front and understand uh, prioritization and then speak with the same voice, that's what we owe the unit, yeah. frankly, because if there's discord, mm -hmm. that really doesn't complement anything we're trying to do collectively. Yeah. And I think part and parcel of that is just building a relationship, right. understanding who the other person is. It's on both of you. And we enjoy each other's company. We'll run things off of each other. And, and if, if we're not having fun doing it, don't know why we do it. So that's right. Yeah. So, Reg, you want to say anything about that or do you want to say agree with the boss? Uh, I think that's all just a vicious tissue of lies and a big cover. Um, <laughs> no. Yeah. No, exactly what the CG said. I mean, it's you, you got to have that relationship, um, and and you can't you know can't allow those teams to exist. But it's really easy to do when you work with somebody that you can really connect with personally and professionally, intellectually. Um, you share the same goals, the same motivations, um, a lot of the same sense of humor and and, and background. So um, I think we've pretty effectively over the last ten months worn a path in the carpet between our two offices, going back and forth, usually for work, sometimes just just for a conversation. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's a great relationship. I'm having the time of my life. Yeah, well, it's, it's it, again, it's all about the relationship because people watch you two very closely all the time. I mean, it's about leading by example, setting the standards and seeing what the boss and the sergeant major are doing. So you got a lot of people watching all the time. Again, I, I'm so motivated to talk to you guys because I have a I, I wasn't going to tell you, but I will. I was on 4860s, A1s, A3s, and then the M1 when it first came out years ago. So I love tanks. Sir. I would have kept that to myself, too. 48. <laughs> That's impressive. Well, I, well I was, yeah, I was on the, the 48 was a long time ago. Sir, Sergeant Major, I, I don't want to take a break, but hold that thought for just a second. We've got to take some advertisers here. We're talking with Major General Jane Pease Eisenhower III, Commanding General, and Citizen Michael C. Williams of the 1st Armored Division, Fort Bliss, Texas. And and if you're not enjoying yourself, something's wrong with you. Uh, these guys are just so motivated about what they're doing and what they're doing, not just uh, for the division, but really for our country. And you're watching your next mission video podcast with me, your host, Jack Antilly, 12th Sergeant Major of the Army. And don't forget, if you're enjoying this discussion, and I know you are, because if you aren't, there's something wrong with you, please like us. Click on that subscribe button below. And also click on the bell next to the subscribe button to receive notifications to to all of our upcoming podcast releases. Sir, uh, there's a lot of restrictions that were put in place at installations around the country during COVID-19, and Fort Bliss is, is no exception. You've initiated a campaign, I love this, Bliss is back. Can you, can you tell me about what that is? 
tours are major. You're right. There were logical and very necessary constraints uh, during the pandemic put on the installation. And one of the things we could sense it was palpable was the appetite for El Pasoans uh, and those who live in Las Cruces to, to come back on post. We've got so many things they can take advantage of. We've got a great museum, Rod and Gun Club, a golf course, the bowling alley. Uh, we've got the largest outdoor mall in, in DOD in Freedom Crossing. Uh, with a theater that has leather seats that recline and they're heated. I mean, this is not normal for a military installation. And so what we kept finding were COVID constraints that we just haven't lifted. The reality was, you know, whether it was a room capacity limitation or or kind of hours of the day, we found people that felt they didn't have the authority to, to come away from those constraints as we moved into a, a different part of the pandemic. So we went across the installation looked at every agency, reviewed the constraints, and made a deliberate decision where conditions were right to come out of that. Uh, and so it, it empowered them to, to come out of it with the caveat that, hey, if we've got to go back to those constraints, we're going to do it. And I think we've proven we're proficient at it. But it's time to move on responsibly. The other key aspect for this was how do we responsibly let more civilians on the installation? And so we had necessarily withdrawn the Trusted Traveler program it was just really difficult for anybody who didn't have a DOD ID card to get on the installation. We implemented a new digital system called NLETS, the National Law Enforcement Technology System. And if you've got a real ID, we register it, and then you can use that ID to come on post. It's actually more safe because it's constant vetting. Anytime there's a change to that law enforcement record for that individual tied to that ID, we'll know about it. And so we can, you know, if something's changed and we're not comfortable with it, we'll pull them aside, explain it and ask them to, to go somewhere else. But what this does is provide responsible access for the community to come on and enjoy the many things that are happening on Fort Bliss. Learn more about the largest employer in, in uh, El Paso. Learn more about their military and military families, kind of who we are and, and our values. And I think that's really important as we continually need to work on developing strong civil military relations. And then it's also fun to get them out there and, and participate in some of the FMWR activities we have whether they're fun runs or half marathons or, you know, a competition at the Rod and Gun Club. Yeah. You, 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 yeah, also, got, have, you, you also have a lot of a large veteran community that lives right there that probably really wants to come on huge. post all the time, I'm sure. That's right. It's like 20% of El Paso's population or something like that is, is veterans. It's a massive number of veterans. Um, and we're, we're involved with them all the time in, in multiple events. Uh, and so being able to bring them on post as well is great because our, our veterans love the connection with – with the division and with the installation and all the services that we have here. Plus the fact that, you know, William Beaumont Army Medical Center is the most state-of-the-art hospital and army inventory right now. It's got everything you could possibly imagine to include. It's got a robo-surgery suite in there that uh, is, I think, one of the first in the Army to be fielded. So fantastic facilities that we've got here to support our local community of, all, like, it's about 850,000 people is the population of El Paso. So we've got a major metropolitan city right outside the gate. So why would we not want to sew that together with the installation since so many of our family members work uh, in El Paso uh, and they, they tell their coworkers all the time about Fort Bliss and so they want to come and they want to experience it. And some of the things that we do here, the community is always interested in doing. Pop Goes to Ford, Fourth of July uh, that we put on is one of the biggest fireworks shows. Uh, we have a fantastic Oktoberfest event that we do every September. Uh, this uh, This is a big hit as well. So yeah, getting the, the community back uh, onto Fort Bliss has been a big part of sewing the installation and the uh, and the community back together. Well, I think the other thing, the, the, uh, El Paso is really a user-friendly installation. I mean, they love the military there. I mean, they're so supportive of the military. They do all Because every time I went down there and talk, I talked to the mayor and the community down there a few years ago, but they're always just, they love, uh, they love the people at Fort Bliss. And the relationship is just unbelievable. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. You know, sir, they, they, they judge Ricardo Samaniego. Uh, the county judge just declared El Paso the, the veterans capital of the United States. <laughs> and it's just emblematic of how much they want to embrace yeah. the veteran population. They've got a large population here. They've got uh, nonprofit 501c3s that work with veterans. They, they work on trend, responsible and efficient transitioning away from active duty uh, and out of uniform into the civilian community. Uh, it's really it's a unique environment. One of the things where our next campaign will talk about how it's better in Bliss, not just in Fort Bliss, but what El Paso is like. I think that there's a there's an uninformed narrative out there that you're going to be in the middle of the desert. It's West Texas. 
There's nothing out there. Next to Juarez. Yeah, good oh, luck. Scary. And if you watch the, the cable news, there's also a narrative there that, you know, we're under crisis, a migrant crisis, uh, when the reality is the migrants that are coming across the border are looking for jobs. They're not criminals uh, who pose a threat. And in fact, El Paso routinely ranks in the top five safest large cities mm-hmm. in the nation. Uh, so it's an uninformed narrative that this isn't a neat place to be. But being near a city that's 850,000 people, they've got UTEP's a Division One A program with all the teams and the, the artistry um, that, that you may enjoy in a typical university campus. We've got award-winning chefs here. I had no idea the food scene in El Paso is so sophisticated. It's not, it's not just Mexican food. It's all sorts of cultures. And there's a Chinese population here. There's a German population here. And El Paso, to me, is, is very much a, it's an accepting city. It, it's a, clearly a border city, but they, they understand different perspectives and they're accepting. And so they welcome folks. They've got three minor league teams, a symphony. Uh, it's just an incredible location. And so we do a lot. We take a lot of time trying to push soldiers off post to go enjoy the local environs because you don't find this type of setup outside any other military institution. No. In fact, El Paso was recently uh, named Hockey Town USA because of our minor league hockey team that we have here, the El Paso Rhinos. A huge attendance to those games, massively popular team. And they do really well, too. Uh, they get into the championships almost every year. Uh, we got the minor league, uh, the locomotives, the the soccer team. We got the Chihuahuas, the baseball team, who does really well. Uh, we like it when they beat the Round Rock Express out of Central Texas. That's always good. Yeah. But yeah, it's uh, huge. Event. Hey, sorry, Major. I, now I, you probably already answered this question, but I'm going to ask you anyway. I, I I heard that there's a saying. That I don't know if you have this saying or not. It's better at Fort Bliss. Is that yours or or do you? It's it's better at Bliss. I didn't come up with it, but I wish I had. <laughs> That, that's a good that's a good moniker. I don't know who came up with that one. That's not going on my NCOER. Well, I was going to say, can you tell me, and you've already told me why it's better. You know, it just yeah. going back, when I was down at Fort Bliss at the Sergeant Major I'm sure they don't have this restaurant now, but they had a restaurant they called, uh, God, what was it, uh, Poncho's or something like that, where you'd go out and, uh, and it was all you could eat, and every time you'd finish eating, you'd raise your flag and they'd bring you more food, right? And so, <laughs> oh, I love the place. So I went out there with a yeah. bunch of guys when I was in the Sergeant Major Academy, and we rolled, we raised our flag, we get more food, we raise our flag, more food. And finally, the last time, the lady come back and says, you guys want more food? I love that place. Every, I think they closed yeah. it down, so I'm enjoying this. I think di- they did. I think they did a long time ago, probably. I'm enjoying discussion, but hold that thought. I'm going to be right back here. <laughs> uh, we got a lot more to talk about, so don't you go anywhere. We'll be right back. You're watching your Next Mission video podcast. You're watching Your Next Mission, proudly presented by the Cavalry Agency. They help brands dominate no matter their size. Ideas, strategy, action. This is Cavalry. Learn more at cavalry.com. Navy Federal Credit Union, the most trusted credit union owned by members of the military community, serving all branches of the armed forces and their families. Their members are the mission. Learn more at NavyFederal.org. Purdue Global, providing affordable online education for hardworking adults. Learn more about a personalized, innovative, and world-class education at PurdueGlobal.edu. Veterans United Home Loans, the number one VA lender for five straight years. If you're buying, they're funding your dreams. Learn more at VeteransUnited.com. Now back to your host, the 12th Sergeant Major of the Army, Jack L. Tilly. Welcome back. We're blessed to be here today with Major General Jane P. Eisenhower III and CSM Michael C. Williams, the command team of First Armored Division at Fort Bliss, Texas. I want all of our viewers to reach out to him direct. Tell us about your transition out of the military. Tell us what topics you had you like us to cover it on the show. I always tell people that it's, it's not our show or it's, it's not my show, it's our show. Uh, so reach out to you, tell me what you want uh, and we'll put it on the show. You can call or, or text me at 844-424-1134 and I'll reach out to you. Or send me an email at uh, smatilly at uh, yournextmission.org. Sir, we're heading into the uh, final segment of the show here today and I, I hope you enjoyed just as much as you have. 
Yeah, what, we was talking just a minute ago. Could you tell us a little bit more about the, you know, the history and the mission of the first art division and, and how they get the name Old Ironside, maybe, too? Sure. Let me start with that, sir, for Major. Old Ironside was actually, uh, you know, the moniker of the USS Constitution. And, and General Magruder, the first CG of the first armor division, realized it needed to have a, a name or a motto. Uh, and he was reading about the USS Constitution. He liked it so much that he took that name. Uh, and put it on the division. And since then, it's been old Ironsides. We joke that there's two old Ironsides. One is a, is a, an important historic artifact that provides an engaging hands-on experience for its visitors, while the other destroys the nations of our enemies. Um, so there's a little bit of a good joking back and forth between the Navy and the Army on, on, on old Ironsides. But we're number one, that's states. for sure. Well, what, did but, you see the game? The Army Navy I'm going to ask you about that question. It. Hold that thought. <laughs> <laughs> when, you, when you talk about the mission, Sergeant Major, we, uh, yeah, it's a standard mission. When directed, the 1st Armored Division deploys and defeats the adversaries of our nations to support national objectives. And we're always fully prepared to execute mission command of Army, Joint, and Multinational Forces as either a U.S. Army Division or as a JTF, a Joint Task Force. One of the things we've explained to our team, though, that makes us different is that th there's only one other division like us in the world, and that's the 1st Cavalry Division. But with 261 tanks, 414 brads, 54 paladins, and four dozen Apaches, we bring more combat power than most countries. And so when our nation calls, it's important to understand that the 1st Armored Division, we don't deploy to deter. We don't deploy to stand in the way. We deploy to finish the job. So America's tank force yeah. is America's finishing force. And we want all our adversaries to know if you're silly enough to, to threaten us, our army, or our nation, the last thing you're ever going to see is this patch. <laughs> I love it. Uh, you know, I remember uh, years ago, though, uh, you know, when they had five tank platoons. I mean, a five tank platoon uh, can destroy a lot of stuff real quick. I mean, you can destroy it, uh, probably a small city really quick. But you're right. The firepower that comes out of the, of the first armor division or armor division is just unbelievable. Uh, man, I tell you what, this it almost makes me want to go back and try to reenlist, and I know they won't take me, but uh, I'm, a little, I'm a little down on that a little bit. So. The MRDs are extended, sir. Right. Well, I room. tried to extend when I, when I got at the end of my career. I said, well, can I stay a few more years? It's no, your, your chapter to get out. Don't come back. So I, that was the end of that. <laughs> sir, Sergeant Major, leadership is a reoccurring theme throughout, the, uh, throughout our podcast. I'd like to ask each one of you to share your ideas about leadership and how you ensure leaders Leadership is happening at really at every level uh, throughout the command. And, sir, we'll start with you. Why don't you go first? I've been talking. Oh, you want, oh, you want, you want him to start, Major, to start? I'll come next. Sure. Are you so, <laughs> so, so how do we make sure leadership's happening at every level? And, uh, you know, part of it is you just got to go and be out in among the forest. You got to go talk to folks. Yeah. Um, you can see it everywhere you go. Um, and one of the things that I try to do uh, is constant communication through the NCO Corps to make sure that leader development is happening because I really do firmly believe that you can solve just about any problem in a unit with leader development and engaged leadership. If you just have those two things, uh, then just about anything else can be solved. So really kind of one thing we focus on is, on the NCO side of the house is just making sure our non-commissioned officers understand their duties and responsibilities and that they're engaged in getting after those things because if you just have an NCO core that does that, you can teach the science of anything. You can teach them how to fix the tanks, how to shoot the tanks, how to maneuver and clear the trenches, how to fire the paladins. We can figure all that out. Uh, but if you've got non-commissioned officers that understand their two basic responsibilities, right? It's really just that simple. The accomplishment of my mission and the welfare of my soldiers. And understand the tools they have to, to accomplish those things and all the subtasks that go with doing those things. Then we're going to be just fine. And so that's really kind of where I try to focus with the non-commissioned officer corps with getting it also goes back to what I was talking about earlier with those three lines of effort that I'm getting after and making sure that our soldiers are trained, lethal and, uh, and fit and equipment is maintained to accomplish the mission and making sure that we're taking care of where our soldiers live, what they eat and where they work to take care of our soldiers themselves. Um, so really it just comes down to focusing on those two basic responsibilities and making sure that we're developing leaders to do those things. Yeah, I mean, we could talk about leadership all day. But, oh, I mean, no, that's really I know you can. Sir, sir, do you want to add anything to that? Yes, yeah, sir, Major. I keep, we, we keep uh, reinforcing uh, 
uh, I think three points because it's it's the basis of I think good leadership, uh, and that's what I tell folks all the time. What we really owe our soldiers is good leadership. But the first thing is you got to talk to them, and so that you can understand your soldier. You need to know the, the characteristics of them and their family uh, because you know that's a projection platform. The family, uh, and if you don't understand some of the things the soldier is dealing with. Uh, and and what they're strong at and where their shortcomings are, you're not going to be able to get the most out of them. So the first is talk to them to, to understand them. And if you understand them, then you can do the second thing, which is solve their problems. It's our major mention this, but that's what leaders do. We've got to solve soldier problems for them. Uh, and when we do that, they're going to be loyal. They're going to want to be on the team. And they're, they're going to have the trust in their chain of command that we've got their back. And the last part of that, if we do those first two things, I think the third obligation, just as leaders, is we're going to inspire continued service. Uh, we miss opportunities. Uh, if we miss opportunities to inspire future service, then we're going to watch retention kind of fall. It'll be harder to inspire others to recruit. Uh, but what we, I think we have an obligation in this profession to make sure we're setting an example all the time in everything we do, from our work ethic and how we take care of soldiers and how we conduct ourselves to make them want to stay in the Army and develop those proficiencies so they can carry that water for others. Yeah, I, I think the other thing though is you got to be approachable. Uh, That's you, right. You got to let people talk. And, and I like the fact that a sergeant major is talking about. You know, I know you're. I, I, in my mind, I'm thinking about your average day. I'm sure you come in, do whatever you got to do in the office, and you're out in the, you're out wandering around, seeing what's going on, checking soldiers, doing this stuff, because they have to see as much as they can. If they see you, uh, both of you, if they see both of you, they'll, they'll trust you and they have confidence in you and they'll do anything you want. Uh, they'll, they'll accomplish the mission. So that's, I think that's always, a, always important. The other thing I think is important is, uh, is be a good communicator, which you both are, and be a good listener, uh, especially as a leader in, in any organization. If you do that, I think, uh, you know, your soldiers or service members will follow you around anywhere. So that's, I mean, leadership is, and you both have said it a lot better probably than I can, but it's about just taking care of people and being honest and, and fair with people and and, you know, treat them like your kids, I guess, in some cases is probably the way to look at it. Uh, you know, we, yeah, go ahead, sir. We tell leaders all the time, sir, Major, we forget when you put a uniform on an 18-year-old, yeah. they're still learning to be an adult. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of what we're doing is adulting, teaching them to be responsible, contributing soldiers and citizens. Well, you, you know, the other thing is I, I talk to people all the time about, you know, serving in the military. And I say, you know, we give an 18, 19, 20-year-old kid, a, you know, a five or ten million piece of a, a five or ten million dollar piece of equipment to take care of. Uh, we put young adults in in combat situations where they got to make a split second decision whether or not to take the life of somebody. And then the last thing I always say is that in the profession that 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 I was in, that you're in right now, that I'll always be in. My heart will always be there. Is that uh, there's no second best in our profession. You know, you have to be the best at whatever you're doing, no matter what it is. And, and we can joke and laugh and have a lot of fun. But the, the fact of the matter is, we have people that raise their right hand and say, I'm willing to die for the freedoms of our country, for you. And I just think that's a, that's a wonderful thing. I, I just wish, and that's why we're doing the show now, I just wish we could educate more people about the kind of sacrifices that, uh, that go on each and every day uh, in our military. Uh, recruiting is currently down throughout the military. I, I know that. and. Uh, how do you educate young people on why the military is, is a great career for them? And we talked about it a little bit, but, sir, you want to add anything to that about recruiting a little bit? Or you want to start yeah, major taker? Go ahead. I'll give a few things. So we're, we're actually operationalizing force comm units to help recruiting command. Uh, and so one of the things we're doing is trying to influence the influencers. So we're talking to you know coaches, counselors, clergy, the parents in particular. Um, and also just let them know about the opportunities that exist in the Army, uh, the travel, the education benefits, the medical benefits. Hard to quantify, but when, when you explain to someone some of the opportunities it's, prevent, it's provided uh, to, a, to an Army veteran, I think that the eyebrows go up. We are trying to defeat a narrative. There's just a survey just came out that was run, I think, by Rand for either DA or DOD, where the number one concern uh, of, of recruits, potential recruits, is just safety. Uh, and so what, what we need to do is back that up with statistics to show. I, mean, I was looking at Department of Labor statistics yesterday that show that the Army, the military, is not one of the most dangerous professions. Uh, it's more dangerous statistically to be a truck driver, um, to work in mines, 
And, and so, so there are common jobs out there uh, that are that are even more dangerous than what we do. And as you know, the, 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 the investment we make in safety uh, and securing others and, and those around us, uh, we need to do a better job at conveying that to the public so they know that not only is this uh, profession safe, we're going to teach you those soft skills and the attributes that, that very few companies teach, but every company values. And we're going to take care of our people because the most important weapon system is that soldier. So we, we went through and realigned uh, all of our partnership here in the local community uh, with, with all of the schools, units to schools. We got 34 schools in El Paso that, that we align with across the installation. And so we, through very deliberate effort, realign all of our units so that we've got uh, that communication happening with high schools and middle schools primarily. And we've got soldiers engaged, going down, spending time with them, assisting with the uh, recruiting efforts that are going on, and really getting after that that narrative that General Eisenhower talked about. We make sure people understand the opportunities that the Army provides. And we send soldiers down to talk all the time about what the Army has done for you. And uh, to talk about, hey, I've done this and I've done that. And, uh, I've been in the Army four years. I've got an associate's degree already. I'm working on my master's degree, et cetera. And because uh, we've got a lot of kids here in El Paso and our school systems that really want to go and do great things. And the Army is a fantastic, fantastic venue for them to get to do that. So a lot of it is just being in the community, which kind of goes Again, right back to what we talked about with, you know, Bliss is back and opening Fort Bliss up to the community to then allow some of those kids, like our ROTC programs uh, with the UTAP, our junior ROTC programs with high schools, to be able to come onto the installation and see a day in the life of a soldier and see all the things that we that they could experience here and what Army life is really about. Because there's actually people out there who still think that in the Army, we're living in the old two-story wooden structures that are open bay with lines of bunks. Um, and that's just not the, re- hasn't been the reality for a long time. And so trying to educate people on what it's like to be a soldier in the army in the year 2023 is a pretty stark awakening for some folks. But, and I've been to some of those events where they, uh, they'll, they'll come on post and they have this realization that, oh my gosh, this is really cool. I didn't know that you had all this. Didn't know you could do all that. And all of a sudden, military service becomes very attractive to them. Yeah. Two things I'll tell you. One is I lived in those billets uh, for a little while. When I-, <laughs> I wasn't going to say that, but the thought went through my mind. Yeah. <laughs> I live it, and I, I, I absolutely have. And also, the other thing is, I helped get out of those billets when I got, you know, got a little senior in the military so I could work on that stuff right there. The, the other thing I'd tell you, too, is when you talk about recruiting, uh, one of the things, in fact, I told the chief this and, and some of the senior leaders that I talked to here lately is that, uh, is that you need to use the veteran community a little bit more because uh, they're out in the community. They're talking to a lot of people. And Sergeant Major, you'll figure this out pretty quick when you retire. But they're out in the community to talk to a lot of people that you never talked to. Uh, and, and, and the other thing I think is really important, you guys are doing a great job, is tell your story. Uh, tell people about, you know, the kind of sacrifice. You know, I was reading an article just a few minutes ago, and it was talking about, you know, most people that, uh, uh, that's, you know, been to war, been to combat, did a lot of stuff, don't really talk too much about it. Well, I always think if you talk about it a little bit, it's therapy anyway. And it really helps you a lot personally. But I think we need to tell the story a little bit more. We need to tell them about the, you know, the deployments, the, the, the good things, and, and be honest with them about the, about the, uh, the life in the military. The other thing I'll tell you, too, is that, and I'm, and I'm sure you can identify with this, the Army changed my life. Absolutely. It made me who I am today. Now, some people will say that's not very good. I'll tell you it's not too bad. But, but it changed my life. You know, I'm a small business owner. I don't have a bill in the world. Finance, I'm pretty stable. Anything, any successes I've had in life, I, I equate to God, my family, and the military. You know, because they really, really took care of me in the military. And, and I, I would say that anybody that's listening to this show here today is that if you're thinking about going in the military, go down and talk to a recruiter. The, everything, anything that you want to do in the military, anything that you want to do in life, you can do in the military because we have all those MOSs, you know, military occupation skills that you could do. Any job that you want to do, it's there. But you've got to try. But, but the biggest thing I think for me too, and I'll sort of shut up here. I, but I, you got me motivated so much I just can't stand. I'm I'm hovering on the chair right now. But, but it it allows you to grow up. It allows you to see things differently. It opens your eyes up. I thought this is what life was back like in in the world. But I got in the military, my eyes opened up, and I really see you know what goes on in the world, not just in my little section of my uh, hometown and stuff like that. You know, before we let you go, I, I want to recognize and ask you about the 1st Armored Division being highlighted 
at the recent, that's why I told you to be quiet a minute ago, at the recent Army-Navy game, and which, oh, by the way, we won. Uh, that must right. have been a, a great experience. Uh, any thoughts about that? Well, I think, you know, those, those players wearing the, the first armored division patch and, and the uniforms that they had, they embodied the spirit of the Iron Soldier, which is you fight until you win. That's right. And it came all the way down to a double overtime, first time in history in that game. Clearly, they were inspired by the patch that they were wearing. You know, there's a, there's a one on it. You have to finish first. Absolutely. We were joking about it, Sergeant Major, right after the game. You know, the, the uniforms are recognizing the 80th anniversary of Operation Torch. And that was the first battle uh, in World War II for the United States Army. And we kind of joke, but there's, there's some clear parallels before it. The beginning wasn't necessarily what you might want it to look like. Right. But at the end, the 1st Armored Division finished the job. And, and those cadets, that football team, uh, you know, played a, a relatively kind of, I, I don't know how the coach would characterize it, but you know, the, the, both teams played to, to a tie at the end of regulation. And that's when those cadets didn't give up, and they finished the job and uh, won in the first time in 123 iterations, the first time that game ever went into overtime. So good on them. We set lots of records. What, was yeah. you, now, were you guys both at the game by any chance? Did you go to the game? We were. Oh, you were both at the game? Oh, wow. Uh, you know, I've, I've been there. Uh, I, I've, I've been up to West Point a few times. In fact, I spoke to West Point uh, years ago, and it was really quite. In fact, I trooped the line. I thought it was really neat. Uh, but that's that was a wonderful. Play. I, I love the fact. You know, I don't care if the Army wins by one point. I just want to win. Uh, and I love that game because I have a bunch of friends there in the Navy, and they give me crap every year if we lose. So I, I just I'm so happy we won. I'm motivated by that anyway. Hey, so first of all, let me tell you, I. I've enjoyed talking to you guys so much. You've, you've really, uh, you know, really motivated. I love the fact that, uh, that two people like you, a commander and a sergeant major, are leading the, one of the best divisions in the United States Army. And, and you're doing God's work. So I just want to tell you, from this old soldier's heart, thank you for what you do each and every day for making a difference uh, in our country. Things that people will never know that, uh, that you guys are doing. Any, any final thoughts, anything you want to share with the audience maybe we missed or anything you want to, you know, talk about? It's, it's, your, it's your platform, sir. Anything you want to say? Any final thoughts? Sir, Major, I enjoyed talking to you. It's a real privilege for us to, to be here in these positions uh, and, and take, you know, the, one of the reasons I, I serve is uh, I really get a lot of personal satisfaction out, out of solving soldier problems. Uh, and some of the best advice I ever got was use your rank for good. So that, that entails a lot of work, but it sure is motivating and inspiring. And before we log off with you, I just want to thank you for your service, but you keep investing in us uh, through programs like this and in our veterans. So thanks to you and your team uh, for continuing to invest in, in our, our profession uh, because it's making a difference. So, hey, just to, to echo what General Eisenhower said, thanks for having us on. This has been great. Really enjoyed talking to you. And again, thank you for what you're doing, carrying the message, carrying the story out across the, across the public and for everybody to hear and help and tell the Army story. Because uh, like you said, that's something that needs to, needs to be done. Um, I, got, I got to tell you what, though, this is without question the best assignment I've ever had has been in this division. Uh, and this is definitely the best job I've ever had. And I've said it before, I've said it lots of times, and I'll say it again. There's only two kinds of soldiers in the Army. There's iron soldiers and those that wish they were. And if I can't be an iron soldier, I don't want to be anything else. <laughs> I'm motivated. God bless each and every one of you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks to Major General James B. Eisenhower III and, and Sergeant Major Michael C. Williams for, for being with us today. I mean, if, if you're not motivated by listening to what they have to say and the, and the kind of commitment, the dedication, the enthusiasm, the motivation. I mean, I can't think of all the words to, to talk about what they're doing, but they're making a difference for us and for me, and for you, and, and really for our country. I'm Jack Tilly, 12th Sergeant Made of the Army, and, and you've been watching your next Mission Video podcast, and, and thank you for watching today. Uh, please visit our website at yournextmission.org and, and leave me a review. I think this should be a good review, but if it's a bad one, go ahead, whip it on me here. You can also visit our nonprofit partners there who can provide with so many services that will assist you in your transition from the military. Also, visit our corporate partners and, and see all the jobs that are available. Please know we want to assist you any way we can. I'm going to say that again. Please know, you know, I'm a soldier. I'll be a soldier till the day I die. Please know we want to assist you any way we can. Please follow me on all my personal social media pages, uh, Facebook, Twitter, 
Instagram, YouTube, LinkedIn, or Rumble. Never thought I'd ever say that, but it's okay. And if you enjoyed the discussion, and I know that you have, with Major General Eisenhower and Sergeant Major Williams, please like us. Click on that subscribe button below, and, and don't forget to click on the bell next to that to subscribe button to receive notifications of all our upcoming podcast releases. You know, it's about a family. we got to stay together. If we stay together, we can help each other out, and that's exactly what we want to do. Don't forget, we want to hear from you. Please leave me a message or send me a text at uh, 844-424-1134 or send me an email at smatilly at yournextmission.org. Thanks again to Major General James P. Eisenhower III and, and Sergeant Major Michael C. Williams for, for joining us today. It was just, uh, you know, I, I just can't say enough. It's just so great uh, having him on the show. And at the end of the show, every time I always get to say my final thoughts about Whatever, but today I'm going to tell you a couple of things. Uh, really, if, if you want to join the military, uh, be a tanker. <laughs> be a tanker. Join the military, do something because it'll change your life. It'll allow you to, to see so many things so differently. It'll allow you to grow up. It'll allow you to protect and defend the Constitution of the United States. It's about our country. It's about a way of life that we can't forget what's going on in this country. We've got to make sure that we stand up and and we understand that, that freedom isn't free. That's why they do what they're doing each and every day for, for all of us. Again, thanks for watching. And thanks to Cloudcast Media, New Mind Studios, and of course, our four presenting sponsors, Calvary Agency, Navy Federal Credit Union, Purdue University Global, and Veterans United Home Loans. For, we, we just appreciate all you do for our military. And as always, See you on the high ground. hoo You've been listening to Your Next Mission, brought to you by the American Freedom Foundation. Learn more by visiting yournextmission.org.